It's cold in the colony. We are starving. We are in real need of some medical supplies. I have a splinter in my finger the size of a small car. So we've sent Colin out to get some antibiotics in the uh, the waste the wastelands out there. This is We're Not Wizards. It's another Friends of the Show edition, and this one is going to be called Starting a Vault War in the Dead of Winter on the Wasteland Express. I'm your host, I'm Richard, and joining me tonight is John Gilmore of Dead of Winter, of Vault Wars, of the soon-to-be-released um, Wasteland Express. So how are you doing, John? I'm doing fantastic. How are you doing tonight? I am. I'm doing really, really well. Yeah, I've had a really, really good day, and uh, this is just to. Uh, this is just going to be. Uh, yeah, this is going to be a bit of fun. So um, I'm, I'm excited to be here. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs> I'm, I'm. I'm. I'm glad you're here, and and there'll be a lot of people that will be um, really happy to hear that we've we've got you on the we've got you on the show. Seeing there's the number of times we've been <laughs> we've been mentioning the word dead of winter, <laughs> so <laughs> you'll be glad that um, you won't have to. Um, worry about hearing that again well we'll still obviously mention it because we have to um for those that aren't aware the reason that we do this is because there are simply not enough podcasts about board games and because we've sent colin outside into the wilderness there are not enough board games that are podcasts that are done just with two guys um so john um we're going to keep the format as the show is normal. So, f- I mean, one of the first things that we talk about is uh, obviously um, what we've got to the table. Okay. But you're, I mean, you're probably doing what a lot of people listening to the podcast would like to do, which is you're involved in kind of like, you're involved in game design. I mean, you design games that have done really, really well that are out there. So, but I mean, going back, what, I mean, was, was there a game that stood out in your kind of, what kind of games did you play when you were younger? Was it the same as everybody else? Monopoly, stuff like that? or um, You know, grow, I grew up in a very rural area in uh, northern New York. So I really didn't oh. have a lot of people around me. It was just pretty much my sister and I. Right. Uh, so we, we tended to play more video games than board games when I was a young kid. Yeah. Uh, then in high school, I was in uh, Boy Scouts and at a, uh, a big brotherhood type celebration thing where like uh because i grew up like right on the canadian border of new york so right, they, would do, okay. they would do these brotherhoods where like all the canadian scouts and the american scouts would get together and camp for the weekend oh, that was um cool. so i got introduced to match of the gathering at one of those and you know, someone right, okay. someone sold me a, a starter deck and a couple booster packs and some extra cards and... were they like a dealer did they say you can get your first card for free yeah oh, <laughs> yeah they knew how to do it i mean they you know, they, they gave me the, the starter deck and some, you know, just crappy random cards for cheap. And then uh, the rule book and sent me on my way. And, you know, within a year I was an addict. So were you, um, did you end up having to like sell stuff and seal steal stuff to kind of fund your, <laughs> fund your magic, your magic habit? <laughs> I, uh, so it, it, it was kind of a blessing that I was in a very rural area. Um, yeah. Because I mean, I was I was a, a kid with a strong entrepreneurial sense. So, you mm-hmm. know, what I did is I got all of my friends into magic and got a lot of other kids in school in magic. Right, and okay. we, we didn't have a game store within an hour of where we lived. Um, and th- this was before the heyday of the internet. Yeah. Um, you, and in the back you, of Inquest, you know, which is a Magic the Gathering. Uh, it's an expansion, is it? Or... Uh, it's a, ma- a magazine back in the day. All right. Okay. Focused on okay. Magic the Gathering. Uh, right. In the back pages of that, I found a distributor that, um, after a few phone calls, I pretended to be a business and I was buying <laughs> booster boxes of Magic the Gathering um, cash on delivery. So were you, like, get, I didn't, were you getting I didn't, them at cost as well? Were you getting yeah, oh, them a yeah. lot cheaper? Whoa. Yeah, I, w- I was getting them for like a buck fifty a pack. So <laughs> I would, you know, I would uh, buy a booster box of them, and and they worked on COD which is a thing that doesn't really exist anymore. No, you don't get that anymore at all. Yeah, so I you know, I called up and they, you know, delivered a box of Magic the Gathering and I handed over my 60 bucks for 60 booster packs or 45 uh, however many. And then you know, they cost me about a buck 50 a piece and I would sell them yeah. for 3 bucks. 
And and I would pretty much just sell half of each box and then keep the other half for myself. So you had a little empire going. Oh yeah, yeah. I had a I had a lunch box that would pack the lunch box with uh you know booster packs. <laughs> And then everybody in my school would come up and buy them during the day. Did you have a little stall at lunchtime? Did people come up and say, hey, man, you got any of this? You got this? <laughs> you got oh, yeah, this yeah. Pack? People would yeah. come up to me in the hallway or at lunch. And, you know, obviously what I do, what I was doing was not really illegal. But, no. you know, I, 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 was mean, fulfill, I was fulfilling a need that wasn't in our community. And it was um, you were being an entrepreneur. That's what they would call that. You exactly. were get, You were getting stuff done. You were providing you were providing, like you were fulfilling a need in your school. So that was, yeah. So, so, so once you built up your empire <laughs> and you <had laughs> laid waste to all your competition, I mean, did was there kind of competition? Did competition appear? Did you end up in turf wars? Uh, no, because nobody else really could figure out like how to you know get a hold of them at that cost. <laughs> like it, it was funny because I just you know. I, I honestly did most of the, my business on a payphone at school. Like I, I, <laughs> this is I, I would throw, you know, like a dollar in yeah. on, on one of my study halls and make yeah. calls to the distributors and get the stuff sent. Um, and, and, they, I, and, and nobody else just thought about it, I guess. And they sent that to did they send that to your home then? So did you get to the point where you were getting a couple of boxes delivered a week or was it just once a month or? I'd probably, I was probably doing like, two or three booster boxes a month wow. um so i mean I, w I was building a really good collection and you know i think at the time the booster packs were actually selling at 350 so like i felt selling them for three bucks you know i was doing people a favor you were still giving people you were giving people a healthy discount and they were still saving themselves some money so i mean you can't you can't feel um you can't feel bad about that so i mean did that obviously that was a business i mean that wasn't just you know you playing magic so did you i take it you played a lot of magic at the same time i mean did that did that help you move into other games is that where you kind of moved on from magic after a while or did you play it for quite some time yeah i played it from about um the dark expansion until the end of the urza saga uh arc which I think was probably about five or six years, maybe. Mm. So I played it for a good long time. And then um, when I moved to uh, Ohio, and went, well, first of all, when I went to college, like I oddly couldn't find many people that played at my college. No. Um, which was weird. I mean, but then again, th this was like 1998. So yeah, so things gaming wasn't died. quite as prevalent. Yeah, things kind of died off a little bit by then. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then and then I moved to Ohio, and I still couldn't find anybody. Um, but I went to a a, a booster draft tournament. Uh -huh. uh, it was probably about an hour away from where I lived, and uh, it, I had the worst one of the worst gaming experiences of my life. Um, Why was I think that? It, it was it was the very first set that uh, Wizards of the Coast had introduced foils in. Right. Okay. And it was a booster draft, so um, you know I. Uh, paid to, for the tournament and I open up my first booster pack and the distribution in magic cards is pretty well set you know yeah, it's you get yeah. x amount of commons and then two uncommons in a rare yeah yeah, yeah. well and in a booster draft per tournament what rares you get is pretty important because that's a lot of what you structure your deck around so I'm so, oh, sorry it, go ahead you got it was bad <laughs> I'm guessing well, this was so, bad so I open up my first booster pack, and the rare spot is a foil basic land. Right. So, I mean, a, a completely garbage card, but it's in the rare spot because it's foiled. And then I open oh, up my right. second okay. pack, and it's another foil basic land. <laughs> so did you just, you pack up and go home if you get that? Well, I mean, I built, I, it, and it, was, it was a little bit of a problem because I'd been out of the game for about four years. So I wasn't totally aware of the current meta of yeah. the game. Because that's but, you know, really, I, that becomes really important. Oh, it's super important in a tournament. Yeah. Um, but I built the best deck I could, and then I got eliminated in the first round by like a ten-year-old. Um, <laughs> and and I was like, up oh, that I'm done. I sold all my magic cards. <laughs> Is uh, that it? Did, did you quit? Did that cause you to quit? It, it did. Uh, which yeah, you know, looking back, I regret it. Like I wish I kept my cards just so I could do really, uh, you know. 
I because I had tons of all the old stuff, so I could do some really awesome um, cubes for like cube drafts and stuff. Yeah, yeah, okay. But then, um, I mean, if you hadn't quit, then you would you didn't you wouldn't have had this fantastic story that you've just told, which is yeah, got beat by a ten year old, and that was it. It's totally <laughs> worth it. Um, so cut to. You know, probably another 10 years later and yeah. uh, my wife and I had been married uh-huh. and um, we, you know, we realized that we were starting to spend a lot of time just watching TV and movies and we would occasionally go over with her parent uh, to her parents' house and play the more you know traditional board games like Scattergories and Scrabble and stuff like that. Um and you know i knew that there were other games in there because like inquest used to have advertisements for settlers of Catan. yeah and, and i was like i know i know that there's better games out there and maybe i can convince her parents to play it because you know phase 10 is just a, an awful game if yeah. you ever played it and you know <laughs> skipbo and uno like those games they used to fill a niche but you know they're they're not as good as they used to be. There's a reason that kind of Scrabble stays in the cupboard for mm-hmm. as long as it does, and that a lot of the, like Monopoly is the biggest kind of, um, you know, everybody seems to have a shot at Monopoly, but everybody also says Monopoly is such a, an awful, <laughs> rage-inducing game <laughs> that it should be, you know, it should be just retired. But, um, I think that. Well, I mean, let's face it. I mean, if I mention board games to people that don't play board games, the first thing that they say is, well, you play in kind of Monopoly or Ludo or Frustration or, mm-hmm. you know, the more inventive ones say Clue or Cluedo. Kind or, of thing. Ri- or Risk occasionally. Yeah, yeah. You play that Risk game? I love the little figures on it. It's like, no, <laughs> there are so many other games out so there. So much better. So what, and then, so did you... did. You you were saying that you were you're obviously looking for a game to play with uh, parents. Yes. So what what did you what did you end up playing? Uh, so I ended up picking uh, picking up uh, Carcassonne, mm-hmm. um, and uh, Bonanza. Okay. Which I mean are both you know fantastic games, and there's still ones that I love to play. Yeah. Um, but they were they were really good introductions. So with those, you know, I was able to kind of get her family and you know my wife to see that there was more to gaming than just that and you know we both kind of got addicted to playing character zone you know just two player until we had the game and yeah. if you play a lot of character zone two player uh, i'm sure most people have had the game where you're just like nope we're not gonna play this anymore yeah because we get very very angry when we do yeah <laughs> i mean yeah i mean um <laughs> I can just imagine. Does does your wife still play a lot of kind of board games now? I mean, is is her interest in the hobby is it grown? Is is your interest has obviously just gone off the chart? It has. It's 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 really good because we you know we had been doing this you know uh, just playing games a little bit for probably six months or so, and uh, she threw a surprise birthday for me and invited a bunch of people over from like. 11 a.m. until you know we got done gaming you know around midnight or whatever Whoa. um and we had a good time and you know afterwards we're talking we're like we should do this more often um mm-hmm. so you know we talked about it and we're like well what if we you know do this every month you know what if what if we you know try to get people to come together every month and play this game so we started up a Facebook group and started to invite friends and hold these monthly game days. Yeah. And uh, we've been doing that every month except for one. Um, let me see. I think our latest, our next one coming up will be number 78. Really? So every month. So it's that's, like almost six years. That's amazing. I yeah, mean, and I, I mean the social. I mean one of the one. I mean one of the things that I've always seen video um, video games suffer from is it seems to be moving away from the lack of social interaction. Whereas board games seem. I mean, okay, you can go to a video game conference, but everybody seems to be playing single handedly in a booth, staring at a screen by themselves. I mean, you 
but you go to like a, any type of game, a board game related, card game, even the skirmish games, you've got people sitting around, even though they're playing against each other, there's the social aspect as well, which I think has really, really helped kind of give maybe board games a bit more of a positive kind of slant than, um, than video games. Yeah, um, absolutely. And we, and we felt like that social interaction was really important for us and something that, you know, we wanted to try to promote within our community. Mm-hmm. So like that, you know, uh, what we do for our game days is like, we, we usually cook like a big main dish, uh, mm-hmm. you know, like a big, a couple of crock pots of, you know, whatever. And mm-hmm. then we just ask that anybody that comes brings like some, you know, some kind of side dish or drinks or something to share. And then, you know, we have between 20 and 50 people show up every month. That's, that's really amazing. And, I mean, and we, yeah. spend all day, you know, playing games and, and you know, everybody's sharing food and, <laughs> you know, it's, it's great. So where, do, I mean, where did you, I guess the next thing is, so where'd you go from hosting board games to actually sitting down and saying, you know what? I could maybe put something together myself because I've got some ideas that might work and I'm not getting that from the games that I'm playing. So, I mean, when did that happen? Um, how, oh, go ahead. No, I mean, how, no, I mean, I just really intrigued as to, you know, you were obviously very, very involved in the hobby by that. So what, what was the switch to make you say, let's get creative? I think um, my, my story isn't really that, unique unfortunately and i and i wish it was a little bit more but um, i don't know the losing to a 10 year old at magic the gathering <laughs> and saying do you know what forget it <laughs> that's a pretty good story <laughs> well you know on the on the design side i you know i started you know kind of just tra- tinkering making little fan expansions for some games yeah um and then you, you do that for a little while and then you're like oh well yeah, I think I I could try to make a whole game. I have an idea that I think is unique, and huh. you know, you make you make that first game, and it's a it's a hard thing to admit, but usually that first game is awful, and, and mine was <laughs> yeah. mine was complete garbage. I'll never go back to it because what was, was just, it? What was it called? Uh, I don't think I ever came up with a title for it, and I really like the concept. And every time I'm like, oh, you know, maybe I should go back and revisit that concept. I'm like, no. It was bad, and I don't think I can make it good. Um, it was. You don't want to be that. Get, this is this is a really good game, and people are going. It's John Gilmore's next game. People line him up, <laughs> and they walk away and go. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm very much about uh, you know ideas are not worth anything. So no. a lot of people are like, well, I don't want to tell anybody my game idea because they'll steal it, and that's mm. really the, the worst perspective you could have on creating games because if you share your ideas the only thing it's going to do is create discussion like yeah i i'll gladly talk about my first design because if somebody wanted to steal it they're welcome to uh <laughs> it was it was a racing game no, no, um, no. where uh you all the players played board gods that were creating this new sport and their I... sport was racing humans against each other um but they weren't allowed to directly interfere with any of the humans so it's a racing game where it, all of the uh, humans on the track move one spot forward every turn. Okay. So everything's going the exact same speed. Um, but what the play of the game was is you would play, uh, you know, play like obstacles in front of the other players, or right, you could okay. you could like you could set a bomb off behind your guy to like rocket him forward. Or you could put like an ice patch in front of somebody else or portals or, you know, so it was kind of this like wacky race game where it was more the people would move the same every turn, but you were trying to affect how they moved to either slow down the other people or speed you up. I mean, to be honest, I mean, me not being much of a board game designer, that sounds like a pretty good idea. (laughs) And I'm sure there'll be people listening to this and going, what, John thinks that's rubbish? That sounds good. Yeah, I'm gonna make. And, I'm and, gonna make. I'm gonna make that. And if somebody does, please just let me know because I'd love to see another approach at it. I just I don't know the solution we, to make it work. We should have a competition to see who can design the best board game, and then the person gets 10, 10 foil packs of magic if they win. 
10 foil basic lands. There you go. <laughs> yeah, stick that in your pipe and smoke it kind of thing. So, so that was kind of my first design, and I... You know, it took me three or four tries of revising it to realize, like, this just isn't good. Hmm. Um, and then I moved on. Because the other part that kind of influenced me to get into game design was I was working in a factory. Um, right, okay. And in high school, you know, I had done a lot of art and other creative things. And when I worked in the computer industry before I moved, um, when I got married, we moved into the area where my wife's family lives. So there's no computer industry in this area that we live right now, or there wasn't at the time. So, you know, I ended up having to get factory work just, you know, to make do until something better happened. So, you know, I really felt creatively stifled um, in that I wasn't making anything. Like, even though I was creating a pro a product for eight hours a day, you know, it wasn't something that I was passionate about. Listen, I know. Listen, I know exactly how you feel. I mean, I funnily, I mean, for people who don't know, and there's a lot, of, not a lot of people that that maybe do. Um, one of the other things I do when I'm not doing the wizarding thing is, or the we are not wizards, <laughs> is I draw. I mean, I draw people, and I was, you know, it mirrors exactly maybe what you're saying is that mm -hmm. my job is. Um, I mean, I'm, a, I'm I'm in sales. I mean, I sell for a living, and I'm mm -hmm. I'm not bad at it. But um, but there isn't as much creativity. So you know, one of the things that I started to do was to draw people, and that's kind of how we got talking because I ended up drawing. Was it you and uh, Jerry Hawthorne and Isaac Vega and Colby as well? And I drew you in a as zombies for like a, a dead of winter kind of montage. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how we got talking, wasn't it? Basically, absolutely. It was kind of from there. So yeah, I mean, I completely understand if you're in a job where you want to be, if your creativeness is maybe stifled in a direction you want it to be. Then yeah, I mean, I completely kind of understand that. So, so the the job that you were doing meant you kind of got a bit more creative out of work. So what were what were the fruits of that kind of labor then? Uh, so I, I, you know, I wanted to keep making these games. And if, if you, you know, for new designers, if you can make it through realizing that that first initial game is probably utter crap mm -hmm. and keep making things like that's, that's really, in my opinion, the key to its success, like just pushing through all the failures because even at this point in my career, you know, I have, I have like 13, 12 or 13 games with publishers right now, you know, not counting uh, Vault Wars and the games that have already come out or that, yeah, you know, yeah. um, but there's way more failures than there are successes. And, you know, games that I, I either won't ever get published or that I just shelved because I can't figure out what's wrong with them. Yeah. So pushing through those failures for any anybody that's creative is uh, really important. So, you know, I worked on my Nets thing, and I think my Nets thing wasn't very good. It was it was a take on um, a, a classic card game like, uh, like Rummy. All right, okay. Uh, except it was team-based, okay. and you, you didn't know who you're – who was on your team. <laughs> so I was, I was super infatuated with werewolf and social deduction games at the time. All right. Yeah. Um, okay. So I want to make like a group social deduction, traditional card game. Uh huh. And like, uh, the, the main mechanic was kind of in rummy where, uh, uh, you would offer cards to other players and all the cards were multiple use. Yeah. Uh, yeah. but you would try to decide by like how you were handing cards to other players and who they were handing them to. You would try to suss out who was on your team. And then, uh, obviously, it had a zombie theme, so it was zombies versus humans. And the cards had, like, some number of brains on them. And the zombie team just wanted, like, every brain that they collected was worth a point. And then the human team was trying to build sets. So, like, right, okay. each, each player scored his individual hand uh -huh. and scored the thing that he had the most of. All right, okay. 
So like it was, it was really cool, and it's it's one I probably will revisit at some point because yeah. it was asymmetric, um, team based. But so that that one I shelved, and then I made a uh, pocket dungeon. Which now, that is, was 2009. That was the one that you the, you you say you released you released on the world. <laughs> it was the off, fr- it was yeah. Go ahead. And office productivity has never been the same. <laughs> um, yeah, it was the first one that I felt was good enough to share, huh. and I felt okay. Uh, you know, with saying here's here's the thing I made tell me what you think of it so i put it on bgg um in the spot and the response was way more than i ever thought it would be um yeah. it was nominated for a golden geek award Whoa. the year that it was put it didn't win but it was still nominated which is well, pretty I mean, awesome that's, yeah i mean that's something that you you can crow about if you get something like that because uh, and i think that... i think it was the most downloaded print and play game that year maybe um, and it was definitely like one of the most thumbed files that came out that year. Um, That's pretty cool. Yeah, it was super cool. And just seeing that response was, you know, really like, oh, well, okay, well, the thing I made wasn't horrible. And now, you know, other people have verified that they think it's okay. So maybe I'll try something else. So, hmm. you know, Dad, I, I had a couple more failed designs in between that. And then I started on. Uh, what became Dead of Winter. And I was honestly probably going to release that game as a print and play as well. Really? Um, well, which... that could have been, that could have made things an <laughs> awful lot more different. <laughs> yeah, it would have been completely different. So yeah. um, I'd been working on it for about a year and our game days were getting bigger and bigger. And uh, one of my friends that I had met locally... Um, was like, oh, well, I know these guys that we used to play Raw Deal with, which is a uh, WWE-based oh, yeah. collectible card game. Yeah, okay. So he's like, well, I know these guys that live about an hour and a half away that we used to play Raw Deal with. Do you mind if I invite them to your game day? Because I think they'd really like it. So I was like, absolutely. So these guys from this place about an hour and a half away started coming, and I became friends with all them. And then they were like, well, do you mind if we bring our friends? So they brought their friend Isaac uh, Vega. Isaac Vega. So, um, you know, Isaac was coming to our game day. So I think the third or fourth game day that he came to, you know, I felt comfortable saying like, hey, I, d- I don't, I'm, I don't want to, like, I felt weird because we were friends. And I was like, I'm not, I, I want, I just want your opinions on this game. I'm not showing it to you because I want anything else out of it. Like, yeah. I'm not showing it to you to pitch it. Like, I just want you to tell me whether or not you think this game it's, is viable. It's good or not, yeah. So, you know, we played it, and uh, we got done playing it, and he was like, that's really good. Um, and he asked me if he could co-design it um, and, with the intention of eventually pitching it to Plaid Hat, because he wasn't full-time with them yet. No. Um, was, he just, fact, was he just... He was... Because he's, he's done, obviously, Ashes himself now, which mm-hmm. is amazing. But he was just part-time kind of there as well, because they've... Plat have grown, and they've been have they been they've been bought out by someone else. If mm-hmm. I'm correct, yeah. Uh, F F to Z, the, the same company that bought out um, Z Man and uh, what's the uh, the guys that did Flick Em Up. All oh, right. Okay. Yeah. I know. Um, I know who you're talking about, but I can't remember the. Yeah, I can't remember that. I can't remember that company's name, which is awful. Well, <laughs> we we were sorry if you made Flick Em Up. Then we. we... We, we apologize to you wholeheartedly for not remembering what you're called. Um, <laughs> um, but they, but they, had, they, yeah, they acquired both those companies. And when I originally met Colby, he was the only employee of Plaid Hat. It really? was a completely one man show, and you know he was getting ready to hire Isaac. Does he so, wear his hat all the time? Uh, no, not all the time. Not all. But he <laughs> does wear it <laughs> occasionally. Occasionally, right? Okay. Um. So. You know, Isaac and I worked on it, went back and forth on it for about two more years before we pitched it to Plaid Hat. And then uh, Plaid Hat liked it, so we just, you know, worked on developing it more. And mm. I was I was still full-time at the factory. Um, 
So Isaac kind of took over the development end of things because he was full time in the industry. Yeah. Um, and then, um, and then it got released. And at that point, you know, once it came out and was starting to be successful, I spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, what I wanted to do because it's a little bit scary. Because I, you know, when I was in high school, I really loved working with computers. Yeah. Um, and then when I got a job in the c- computer industry, like I didn't want to work on my own computer anymore. No, no, and, exactly. And it's a real common thing that like when something becomes your job, that you kind of fall out of love with it, and it's because it's something you have to do. Because you're doing, yeah. I mean, you're doing it every day, and sometimes you need to be able to have a distance with it to realize where your kind of your passion lies. I mean. When, when you got a copy, an actual finished copy of Dead of Winter, what was that like? Was that a? I mean, what kind of? Do you still remember that day? Do you remember when you got the? Here's your here's your copy. Oh, of absolutely. Dead of Winter, fully finished. I mean, do you, did you get two? Have you still got one shrink wrapped? <laughs> I, did I you don't sign have it. <laughs> I, I don't have any shrink wrapped. I'm I'm really bad. I give I give away most of my. Uh, yeah, you know, most of my designer copies because yeah. I either give them away to friends and family, um, or you know I'll donate them to you know causes that you know are raising money. So I I still I still have my very first copy Dead of Winter. It's the yeah. one that I've played probably 125 games of it on, um, and I you know used it for all the expansion work that I did. Yeah. And we'll, get, um, I mean, we'll but, get on to we'll get on to that, you know. And obviously, <laughs> uh, as you're probably aware, I I called <laughs> I called the long dark, the dark <laughs> night. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, okay. I'm really glad you heard that episode. <laughs> 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 you totally apologize. Like, oh, that's good. As long as he hasn't listened to all of them. <laughs> nope, like, listen nope. to all of them. <laughs> listen to all of them. No, I called it the dark night. Yep. <laughs> no, I had to apologize. Yep. <laughs> There's very little Batman in that game. <laughs> There, there could be. There could be. I'm not. I'm not gonna ruin any surprises for anybody. I, I'm not. I'm. I, I. I mean, I am. Um. I'm anxious to get my hands on a, on a copy of it because. Um, yeah, just because you know it's it's it's, it's an expansion. It's an expansion to, a, a, a favorite game of mine. But um, that's kind of uh, beside the point. So, Dead of Winter's out there. Mm-hmm. You've obviously um, kind of moved on. Um, one of the things we can touch on. Um, kind of later on is kind of what you're working on at the moment and what you've recently kind of been working on as well you know um because vault wars is another game that we've had quite a bit of fun with at the club it's a it's a good old uh, auction game which we'll touch on with you being involved in the industry and with you having to sit down every day with your white piece with your white pieces of paper because i've read this stuff on wasteland express <laughs> um are there games that you're playing at the moment that still kind of get you excited? Is there stuff that you've got to the table? I mean, like what we say is we've got the get to the table kind of section of the show, but is there stuff that you've recently kind of got to the table that you've went, this is pretty good, I like this. I mean, is there games that you, or do you, I mean, you must play a lot of games to help you with your ideas, but are there any ones that you've played recently that you, you've kind of liked that uh, you've oh, really enjoyed? Absolutely. My, one of my biggest problems and my friends made fun of me uh because they every time i tell one of my friends that a board game's good they're like we we can't trust your opinion like i love almost every board game that i play <laughs> everyone about the only time um that they listen to my opinion is when i tell them i didn't love that game they're like oh well it's probably awful if john didn't fall in love with it then uh we probably don't even want to play it (laughs) i mean do you um do you get people do you get people sending you games do you get like mysterious packages in the post with people saying here you go what do you think of this do you get that people sending you stuff every now and then i mean i like to it's important to me um so if if a new designer or someone who's you know working on you know becoming uh you know into the industry 
if they're like, hey, will you take a look at my game? Um, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm almost always more than happy to make time to do that. So, um, you know, if a designer out there wants to, you know, share a game with me, you know, I usually tell them, yeah, send me. I, I can't always take the time to print out and put together somebody else's prototype. No. Because that's, you know, an extra two or three hour commitment that I can't make. But if somebody wants to send me a copy of their prototype, I'm yeah. almost more than happy to get it to the table and, you know, give them some feedback and some help. Because people did that for me coming yeah. up. Yeah. And you're just kind of, you're just kind of playing it forward at, the, at yeah. the end of the day. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when every now and then I, I, I feel, I don't like to get free games because I feel like I'm abusing my power. I even feel bad when I go to a convention and use think, my it, and use my it, industry badge to get in before the door is open to buy like a super hot damn that I'm excited about before anybody else can. Is it not just a case though it's shelf space as well? <laughs> I mean I mean I I have a problem <laughs> I have a very bad problem. Uh I I have a ridiculous number of board games. Yeah. Like an embarrassing number, like probably in the two thousand range. There's nothing wrong with that. I so, mean, that's you know, you 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 obviously that's you helping to document an entire hobby. I mean, you could catalog that stuff. You could have a shop. I I still try to convince myself that I do it because <laughs> because of that. I don't know if that's true or not, but that is definitely the excuse I use on my tax. Somebody has got to be going out and getting all these games because if some disaster happens. <laughs> And we're all wondering what happened to the board games. We can go, let's head down to John's place. John's got all the board games. Well, it's, <laughs> some, it's... Kind of, some kind of strange apocalypse type movie. <laughs> yes. Hey, I tell you what, if Dead of Winter becomes true, we can head round to your house because, you know, we may be cold and hungry and tired, but we'll not be bored. We didn't build a, build a hell of a barricade out of all of them. <laughs> um, but so it, is there I mean, anything is there anything at the moment that you're kind of you're really kind of enjoying playing? I mean, I mean, we mentioned off the oh yeah off, <laughs> off the cast code names very quickly. Um, yeah, um, is there any anything? I else love code names. Could... Uh, uh, we've been playing uh, a lot of Deception, Murder in Hong Kong. All right, okay. Um, if you can get your hands on that, that is like werewolf mixed with Mysterium and dips it. Yeah, you know that you know that I'm not a, supposedly I don't like Mysterium. Uh <laughs> apparently, according to Colin, I don't like it, but yeah. I I, I, like... I honestly think that uh Deception is better than both of those games. Oh. Well, there you go. Uh well, it, do, well, it does social you... deduction well, really well. Um it does the because what's uh, what's neat is that everybody has cards in front of them. Yeah. And the person that's giving clues um, after, like, if I was the uh, forensic uh, investigator and I I gave my clues, I have to give my clues silently. Mm-hmm. But then all the other players have to take turns discussing what they think the clues mean. Oh, right, okay. So there's a lot of context within that discussion. That's pretty cool. Um, I just got my copy of Scythe the other day. <sighs> Don't, because I missed out on that one and I'm gutted oh, no. because I had to get some work done on my car or there was mm. some kind of financial emergency and I had to go I had it and then I went no nah, I have to I have to cancel this I have to there's a, there is a list I think on, of Kickstarter games that I have cancelled um, because of financial constraints and Scythe mm-hmm. is one of them so you're you're now going to tell me that Scythe looks horrible has shoddy mechanics and is potentially the worst game you've ever played just to uh, make me feel better if, if it makes you feel better yes all of that is 100 percent the truth thank goodness for that <laughs> it's it's not though is it it's brilliant isn't it uh i've only gotten to play it once with three players so all right okay um uh, but so far i really did what it's doing okay i'll pretend i didn't hear that <laughs> 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 but I understand completely. Like I, I backed out of uh, Zombie Side back Black Plague. Like, that was. A, I'm not a huge Zombie Side fan. Like that was one of the games. One of the reasons I started on Dead of Winter because I felt like the other zombie games that existed weren't doing the things I wanted to. Yeah. But I feel like Zombie Side does Left for Dead zombies pretty well. All right. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
so I was really excited about Black Plague. So now I'm I'm desperately hunting around to try to find a Kickstarter copy of that. They're going for a lot of money at the moment. They're going for about I've seen them for a couple hundred pounds. Yeah, I missed um, yeah. I missed like there was uh somebody listed one and they were selling it for what they paid. Oh, and I missed dude. out on it. No. I mean, it well, went instantly. Like, within a minute, somebody had offered to buy it. Well, let's start up the John Gilmore appeal <laughs> for zombie, zombie side. Black no. is Black Flag. No, if, I, you I, are, I, if, you, if you are looking to sell your copy to John, get in touch. I would be more than happy to take your copy off from somebody's hand. If they, there you uh, go. We'll put this out there. We will. <laughs> we'll get everybody to retweet it. We'll get you your copy. Poor, It'll be like poor John yeah. Gilmore. He's... Poor George. Yeah. Get get johnzombies.com. You heard it here first. <laughs> there is pain. There are tears, but there is also hope. <laughs> um. But okay. So those, yeah. Those are. Few... Nonsense. Yeah. <laughs> those are a few of the things that have been hitting the table lately and lots of prototypes like i do prototype nights one night a week so we so play. is this when you get the cards out and just say okay let's muck around with stuff and see what we can come up with or yeah. is it stuff that you've already been doing um it's both i mean i usually do most of my like really loose prototyping during the day yeah and i try to bring something that's at least somewhat functional to prototype night uh-huh. But we have a, a really great local group of guys who all are interested in designing. So um, there's, I think, at least five or six of us that meet up every Tuesday night. And almost everybody will bring a game. So Yeah, I've seen the, I mean, I've seen the, 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 um, the Facebook posts. You always seem to be playing something and making me wish <laughs> I was playing something as well. But <laughs> no... I mean, are there games that you've... I mean, obviously you mentioned Zombie zombie Side. Are there any other games that you would like to play that you've seen recently that you would like to get your hands on? Um, I mean, that, that's that been a big one. There's a few um, Essen or... Uh, I'm, I'm really excited for Yokohama. Yeah. Um, and there's a couple other games from the uh, Japanese game... Uh, fair that really had me excited um and some of the Essen releases from last year that we're still kind of waiting for to trickle out over here yeah yeah i mean there's obviously there's then there's also kind of kickstarter games that come out that then get kind of like a get kind of like a retail release as well oh um, I'm, and i'm i'm eagerly awaiting my copy of fire team zero yeah uh that was a game that I kid started, um, and it's got gorgeous minis in it, and they had some production problems, so they just sent out the base game. Oh, right, that's a shame. And the base game is pretty decent, but like, there's so much expansion stuff coming that I feel like I don't want to play the base game until I have all that other stuff. So that's that's one I'm really excited for to come in. As you know, we. Um... We do give it a kick, so this seems like a natural progression. Obviously, you're not only um, somebody that you know has a lot of interest on Kickstarter because I think we follow each other on Kickstarter. So mm-hmm. on occasion, see, you know, John's looked at this. John's back, you know, this, and it's um, you've had um, Heroes and Tricks quite recently that you were involved in with um, was it Eduardo Baraf. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you obviously also had Vault Wars, which was a Kickstarter kind of campaign as well. Um, a lot of people will know you about uh, will know you by Dead of Winter, but there's maybe not as many people will know you about Vault Wars. Um, I have played Vault War. I got. I mean, I've got a copy of Vault Wars. I've had a lot of fun with it. And it's it's for those that aren't aware. It is essentially, you know. All, all the heroes that win, that's fine. They go home with the treasure. All the heroes that die, what happens to the treasure that they've accumulated, basically, <laughs> in, in their vaults? And the idea of this game, it's like a, an auction game, stroke almost kind of bluffing game where people take turns to be the kind of the aux- the auctioneer, and everybody else decides to bid on certain cards. Um, 
certain treasures and then they have the option to store these items in order to gather sets of items or or they have the option to um, discard them or, or pay for storage or actually wear them that they have different effects. The question I've got yeah, for you about Vault Wars, the miser card, the card that said you're not allowed to put any, you're not allowed to store anything that round, yeah? What'd you put that in for? Because that lost me my last game. It's, it's you're not allowed to sell anything, right? Yeah, pretty much. Um, <laughs> because we wanted to add a little bit of risk to it. Yeah. Um, it, and, it, it and utterly force, wiped me out. <laughs> and, you know, force players like, oh, you might get a lot of stuff, but you're going to have to store all of it because you're, you're kind of infected with the, uh, the miser disorder and you're going to hold on to everything for the turn. I know. It totally, <laughs> I think it was like the second last round or something like that. Oh, and I got yeah. this. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to win this. I'm going to win this. I need to get some stuff. Because I was aware, I was looking at other people's cards. And they all had sets of stuff. And I went, okay, I'll get this, 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 and this. And I couldn't get rid of some stuff. So I ended up having to, you know, I, I ended up losing money. I just ended up crying. I was throwing stuff about <laughs> the room. I was generally quite quite unhappy. But, um, yeah, I mean, Vault Wars is, 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 is fun. Can people... Um, is it available out there kind of commercially? Can people pick it up? Yeah, I believe uh, through floodgate.com. I know okay. that we uh, just did a second printing. Cool. So well, hopefully uh, that should be either here or here very soon for Gen Con. Um, but if it's, not, if it's not available right now, it's available for pre-order at floodgategames.com. So that's floodgategames.com. And and pick yourself up. I mean, what's how much is it? About twenty five dollars or something? Uh, I think it's twenty five US. Yeah, that's not bad. I mean, it's a good, it's good, it's a good fun game, and we've played it. We've played it a good few times at the club, and we had a, we had a lot of, uh, we had a lot of fun with that. It was it was kind of cool. Um, heroes and much. tricks. Hero, <sighs> heroes and tricks. I mean, you designed it. I mean, it's a good, it's a good game. Um, well, thank you. You know, it's a, it's no, it's a, it's good fun. Heroes and Tricks. That was another one that we were kind of I mentioned on briefly. Um, that's been successfully funded. Was that last month or the month before? Um, it started in May, so it ended last month. Yeah, yeah. How's how are you getting on? With, how's how's production moving on with that? Then is that? Uh, it went real good. That... All the all our, we did another large. I'm very big about doing large play tests for all my games. Yes. Um, that was something that was important to me with Dead of Winter. And yeah. you know, because of that, Plaid Hat started doing a playtest corpse where you know, we ran Dead of Winter through 100 groups, which was kind of unprecedented. I won't say it was unprecedented in the industry because I'm sure there's been other people that do that large of a, lot, a play test. But yeah. it's definitely unprecedented for Plaid Hat um, to have 100 groups playing a game and you know ask them to play it. 10 to 12 times within a month period is pretty huge. Um, so we've, I've tried to push that with every game that I've done so far. So we did that with Vault Wars. We did it with Heroes mm. and Tricks. Um, and it just wrapped up all the playtesting. So we're in the process of putting the final polish on it. Mm. Um, and then it should, I believe the Kickstarter says fulfillment will be early next year. That's but cool. but I know Ed's a little bit conservative with his uh, estimates, so people may see it a little bit before then, like maybe around yeah. the holidays. But I don't want to promise anything because it's not on time. Yeah, people no, I mean um, Ed, Ed Wardobaraf. If you um, he's he the last game that he did was also a Kickstarter kind of lift off, get me off this planet. But he's quite active on the scene in terms. He does a lot of YouTube videos and let's plays and and stuff like that. He's he's actually well worth um kind of check um checking out. I'll probably put a link, um I'll put a link to him in the actual show notes um because I th- um yeah liftoff's a great game if you haven't mm-hmm. if you haven't if you haven't played that um, yeah it's very my good. Son, me and my son played that and and he was the quality of the pieces were um were kind of very 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 good. I think um, you'll I think you'll be surprised in Heroes and Tricks, one of the kind of novel things about it is the box is a component of the game. I saw that that you actually use the box in order to play the game and that was I think that was one of the things that made me think, mm, this is gonna be um this is worthwhile 
definitely kind of um yeah definitely kind of looking at you know i think we had a pretty unique concept that we came up with and and ed took that attention to detail and put it into the box so the box really stands out as something special is i mean kickstarter seems to have been quite um quite good for your yourself i mean is that a route that you're going to continue to take because obviously on the other side of it you've got the plaid hat side of things they, they seem to they don't seem to go down the kickstarter route at all i mean they're releasing um they've obviously had their entire mice and mystics uh, season uh, series of games they've got their new naval game which is coming out which i can't Seafall? remember Seafall, which i've looked at i'm um, really excited for that one I've lo- I've looked at that. Do you know what I, I I had an email conversation with Brian from Plaid Hat about the shipping to the UK because I think the shipping is about it's another sixty pounds on top of it. Um, so I was I've kind of like <coughs> went yes, and then went mm. no. I might have to I might have to wait until it comes over to the to the UK. But also, obviously, they've got um, what your your friend um, Isaac also has done, kind of Ashes as well. And mm-hmm. that's got kind of expansion. So they they gen- they seem to be going with a model of funding stuff themselves, and then obviously putting it out. They don't seem to go down the Kickstarter route. You've Correct. done a lot of a lot of Kickstarter stuff. Um, what's your? I mean, I I asked you know I've asked this of you know when I interviewed kind of Jeffrey Greer, I asked him about his thoughts on the Kickstarter. With you kind of being an established, well known kind of game designer. Um, do you have an opinion on seeing like the black, you know, the the zombie side guys kind of sticking a Kickstarter on there? And um, is it a really, really good thing to have? Is it you know, sh- you know, these big, bigger companies putting Kickstarters out there, or do you think they should maybe take the plaid hat route, or is it up to them really how they do it? Because I mean, it's it's totally up to them. I I think that Kickstarter is fantastic for smaller companies. Yes. Um, because it, it is very expensive to print a board game. I mean, even a smaller board game like, uh, you know, Vault Wars, you're talking probably like twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars up front. Yeah. To publish it, so yeah. kids, you know, Kickstarter obviously helps you leave that up front thing. Yeah. Now, I yeah, you know, in my opinion. It, it's tough. It's it's really tough because I, I don't want to say that I don't think any company should be using it, but I feel like at a certain point it gives a company some level of legitimacy to not put games on Kickstarters, but then you can put yeah. uh, you can put a game with an IP on Kickstarter and you know make a hundred thousand dollars without a lot of work. Yeah. So I mean, I I don't have a problem with the bigger companies doing it. I think. At some point, a company should say, oh, well, we don't need it. Because really, if if they could run their own pre-order campaign, like yeah. G- GMT does the P500 system, uh-huh. where yeah. when they announce a new game, they wait until 500 people have pre-ordered it through their website, and then they put it to printing. Yeah. yeah. So they made sure that the demand's there before they print. And yeah. doing something like that, I mean, you aren't, paying kickstarter the extra 12 percent. so even if you made a little bit less by not getting that advertising you know once you've built up a customer base yeah you know, i i always think that a co- you know, companies need to think like oh well we could just do the status quo but what if we tried something a little bit different it's um and i, I like what companies do but i i don't have a problem with it it's, I mean, let's face it, things are finding their feet. And if you are able to get out to a massive audience on a platform that a lot of people... I mean, let's face it, Board Game Geek have on their newsletter, they have, like, the here's the kind of the Kickstarter of the, the week and they usually put mm-hmm. one or two up. I mean, obviously, I hear from Kickstarters through friends that are backing stuff. You know, I che- I go out and check stuff kind of myself so it is a, a kind of a, a kind of a marketplace i guess and, unless you're really strong and fierce on your marketing um and, and can... i think maybe it's more on kids starter like maybe they should change what they stand for yeah and, you know because it, it used to be a platform for small businesses and people with ideas to launch those ideas yeah and if, if that's what they want it to be then that's fine but 
people they, that kind of stick to that ethos, haven't they? I mean, it, they either have to stick to it or change and say, "Hey, yeah, we we're a pre-order system." There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, that's that's fine. I don't have a, I mean, I, I don't actually have a pro. I, I don't really have a problem with it because there's a lot of really really happy people out there that have got into the have really got into board gaming and it's given a lot of companies a lot of exposure and it's given mm-hmm. a lot of companies a, a more stable financial base for them to go out and and, and and you know build more exciting kind of um, games and I guess it also allows them to kind of take a risk as well you know there's there's nothing to stop you know cool mini or not saying guess what guys we're not doing a kind of the standard miniature game we're going to do something slightly different and there's a chance that a lot of people, based on the fact that they they do what they do, um, will go ahead and back them. So it's it's, it's kind of um, it's kind of interesting. Yeah, and but it's nice. Do... It's nice because a company can kind of like you're saying explore that and say, oh, we want to do this thing that's different, and we want to make yeah. sure that it's you know not going to be a huge failure first. Well, I've just had something fall off the wall. <laughs> One of my kids' pictures. Oh no, it's fine. It's just a piece of paper with a with a clothes peg on it, but um, you should have stuck it up with something a little bit stronger. It's all good. It's all good. But yeah, <laughs> um, so um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, as I say, if they change it, that's fine. If they stick with the status quo, it's going to be fine. It's still a very very exciting time. I mean, who would have thought that um, they said recently that more people are going to kickstart board games than they are doing for video games now because mm-hmm. nine times out of ten or 99 times out of a hundred you are getting the product whereas it seems video games you're getting kind of delays or you're not getting you know you're getting a really really kind of disappointing kind of product um there was a, i think a, a game based around the or very close to like the Mega Man franchise that got released recently and it was on the back of a kickstarter and I think it got panned universally by the critics. Mighty Number no. Seven, I think, was the game. Yeah, right? Mighty Seven or Mighty Number Mighty Number Nine. Mighty Number Nine, nine yeah. yeah, yeah. And it, yeah, I guess because on Kickstarter everybody's pushed to making let's play videos and get previews and you know previews done and actual almost like mini kind of pre-release reviews done, then you're kind of pretty sure of what you're going to get at the end of the day which is kind of cool well and, and you know i think i think one of the things our industry needs a little bit more of is a little bit of transparency like yes. and it's something that the video game industry is discovering like there was just a you know big controversy about some youtubers being paid by warner brothers yeah uh to promote their games and not disclosing that yeah. and and there are some youtubers that are very good about disclosing that it's a paid kickstarter preview yeah, and then there's but I other... think it was the manner that you know they were told that make sure what you do is you have lots and lots of text before you say this is a paid um, advert, mm-hmm. uh, and then you had to click more. You know, you, if you see the text on YouTube, you've got the show more bit that kind of expands everything, and they were kind of saying, well, listen, you have to press the show more button, and then that will show you at the very bottom it was a paid advert, and I think the the um, the advertising guys went, mm, this is um, this is not good. Yeah, but, and, then, um, and there's a big controversy right now. Um, Counter Strike Go, oh, yes. uh, uh, the the betting websites where you go and oh, you yeah. put you put up your items and you feed them to a bot and then they get randomly redistributed. Who would have thought that people kind of selling kind of different colored skins for guns would have been such a money making well, idea? You know. Yeah, the, the 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 YouTubers that are promoting that own the company yeah exactly and, and don't disclose it and then so, their defense their defense was well you know people should be checking out the ownership the owners of a website before they click on the link and it's like no nah, <laughs> nah. <laughs> uh, what <laughs> yeah and, and you know i think yeah i think i think we need a little bit more policing of kid starters too because it's there's a plague and and i'll I promised myself I wouldn't get into it on this on this podcast, but there's, you know, a lot of games that don't necessarily promote good things, yeah, and you know that promote sexism and racism and stuff like that that make yeah. it to Kickstarter and either aren't upfront about it or occluded a little bit, 
or yeah. just you know fly in the face of oh we're being super offensive and yeah. you know those things i think are bad for our industry yeah i think yeah there's the i think cards against humanity is um is uh, you know some people find it very very fun um i've read i've read reviews uh, shut up and sit down did a one of the guys paul dean did an excellent mm-hmm. kind of write up about um cards against humanity that if you haven't read it then it's worthwhile kind of having a look over it's kind of an interesting his take on on where it is um where it was as a game and obviously that's moved on to i guess you get with any games you get a lot of clones and if something is very very successful then um you're always going to get a clone if that ends up being a bad thing for something um Mm -hmm. sometimes it can be a good thing but I mean, the the standard joke on Kickstarter is there's always somebody that's making chess version two or super <laughs> chess or you know chess you know chess 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 or you know look at this <laughs> what a lovely big chess kind of thing. Yes. You know? <laughs> there's, and there's always going to be people. There's always going to be people like that. Yeah. <laughs> so know, I mean, but, as creators, just everybody needs anybody who's out there making games should just think about like. How how are the decisions that I'm making in this game, and how how is what I'm going to put out there going to affect other people? Mm-hmm. Is it going to make people happy, or is it going to make people feel bad about being who they are? And yeah. if if the answer is the former, then don't do that thing. Yeah. Like if you, if you're just making a cloned knockoff of Cards Against Humanity, which then you're not designing a game. No, you're just it, you're jumping you're jumping on somebody else's bandwagon of ideas and and trying to ride the kind of the the gravy train i guess you know Um, yeah and and, you know i think i think we just as an industry need to stop accepting like oh that's okay Mm -hmm. and you know games that promote that kind of uh you're not i feel like cards and humanity has made steps to fix the things that they did wrong Hmm. um you know they they took out a lot of the really offensive cards yeah And, and you know a lot of the other points that paul brings up about you know you're it's not you're not really being funny when you play it um you know you're just you you're putting together a punchline that doesn't take a lot of thought no i you know i i agree with him but i think if people like that that's fine because it it's going regardless of how good or bad a game is like people pan munchkin and flux yes uh but if those games help bring more people into the industry i think yeah. that outweighs the, them not being good. Yeah, I mean, it opens their it opens their eyes into what else is available, which is always a you know somebody that's got cards of humanity might also pick up code names. They might pick up um, one you know once night a werewolf. They might pick up you know then they might move on to Carcassonne. They might move on to mm-hmm. Kenny and other games. You know, um, and, I, well. and so I think that that's always, okay. That can always be a good thing. Yeah, yeah. Now, um, we're obviously we are going to talk about the. The Wasteland Express, but we had. I went. Oh, I'll, I'll put out a question if anybody's got any questions for John. And you know what happened? There were lots questions. Of que- there were lots of questions. So I'm going to run through. I've got. Um, run through as many as we can. Um, we can't promise we're going to get any of them, but um, I'll, I'll get the all the way through them because there are some. There are some interesting ones, and there's also some. <laughs> There's a couple of guys that have just complained, <laughs> which is quite. You'll have those. Good. Yeah, well, that's the boys from Polyhedron Collider, mm-hmm. which I think you you picked up on. But we'll, yeah. we'll read them out anyway. Um, there's a. This is from the kind of the um, a couple of guys of DM directly, just asking. Um, this is obviously in relation to possibly Dead of Winter. How do you design a co-op board game? Um, that to minimize the quarterback effect and i guess what they mean by that is one pair one person taking charge and running the show um i guess that's one thing that you see with pandemic is that you get you know somebody goes cure this cure this cure this go here you go there um d i mean that doesn't happen as much in or a lot in dead of winter because i guess the scenario is so many different scenarios i mean were you conscious of that when you designed it that you needed to make the kind of the variables of the outcomes and the scenarios as different as possible um i think i think that was part of it the other thing is 
um, that, you know, we have a hidden traitor, so you can't fully trust anybody's motives. Yes. Like, if, you, if you're telling me to go do something, you're telling me to go do that. And even with just the secret objectives, if you're, if you're telling me to go do something, it's probably because you have other stuff to do. So why should I listen to you? I have mm. my own stuff to do. Okay. Um, okay. I, I think, I really think the quarterback issue is about 75% a player issue and about 25% a game issue. So yeah. you can you can do things to help relieve it a little bit. Yeah. Um, like Flashpoint does a good job if you've ever played it. It's the firefighting game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's yeah. very it's very similar in play styles to Pandemic, but it adds a rule where a player can uh, save their action points for the next turn. And like that that little change makes it so that a player who doesn't know what to do has a safety valve. You don't have to spend every action as efficiently yeah. as possible. You can say, oh, I don't know what to do. I'm just going to pass gonna, and, and save these other back. two points. Yeah. So, you know, you don't have another play, player telling you what to do. You still can. I mean, mm -hmm. it's still, it still happens in that game in Dead of Winter, but in Dead of Winter, you can just tell the other player to sod stop. off. Yeah, stop it. <laughs> So, sort your life out basically or you're gonna get <laughs> exiled mate exactly and that was that question was by um lion yeti um the next one is by uh sea bird song um he says the, i don't know if you have anything to do with this but he says the dead of winter card replacement app has a substantial rules change where you don't get to know the results of a choice before choosing it what's up with that what's up with that john what's up with that What's up um, with it, John? <laughs> I I definitely have opinions about that. Ooh. Did <laughs> uh, you? All right, okay. I I've, I have stated those opinions on Board Game Geek. All right, okay. Um, I probably shouldn't restate them, but if people want to look, they can go find what I feel about that. Well, if you pop me a link, I can always put it in the show notes so people can read it. Well, I mean, basically, boy, it's down to ever since the game. I'll just say it anyways. I don't care. Mm. Uh, okay. Since the game came out, players said that they thought that the crossroad cards would be better if they behaved like that. Yes. So with with the app, we gave players the ability to play the game the way they wanted. All right, okay. In my opinion, it's not the best way to play the game. Hmm. Because here's, here's the situations. You've played yeah. Dead of Winter a good number of times. Yeah. So if you're using the app and a new player is reading a crossroad card, and let's say, um, you know, Mary is a new player, and uh, she has to make a decision, and all she knows is what the text says, but not the actual outcome of it. Yeah. Like the app does. Then the the outcomes are either a she chooses randomly, and she could possibly make a choice. Like let's say we have one morale left, and option A is nothing happens and option b is we lose a morale yeah so she either chooses randomly and we 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 have a 50 50 shot at losing the game yeah or b you say choose option a because you've played the game before. because you've you played the game the before card, yeah and you remember yeah. the card so it, essentially it's the same thing as reading out the entire card except mm -hmm. you're taking the decision away from that player and yeah. she's saying she's doing what you said instead of making that decision on their own herself. Yeah. yeah. So if pe if people want to play that way, that's fine. And if you and don't, you're better using the. I guess you're better using the original card. No, you can, can totally, you can totally, you can totally still play it that way with the app. You yeah. can you can go and look at the result and then back arrow and look at the other result. All right. Okay. And then make the decision. So I mean, I love the app because it does all the narration. It helps people who don't want to read. Uh, the card, yeah. Um, but I mean, I think th there's still plenty of good things about it, and and these things that with feedback they can change. I mean, with feed, you'll probably find you know you give it, you know, with the new expansion coming out, they might address that and they might say, okay, here's the option. You can either have option A mm -hmm. where it gives you the choices, or you have option B where it yeah. blanks them out. You know, you, there's because it's an app, these things can be can you know these can be pretty fluid as well. I mean, that's not. A, it's it, not it, an issue, but yeah, and we want the players to play the game that they the way they enjoy it. Like yeah. I mean, just like they can play with or without a betrayer. 
Yeah, exactly. If, if you don't want that experience, that's fine. And if, if you want a slightly more story-rich experience... Um, but I also feel like if you have to make a decision about your life of, like, do I move to a new city? Like, as a human, you can kind of extrapolate what the outcomes are. You yeah. can say, oh, well, if I move to the new city... Uh, I'm going to have to make new friends and I'm going to have to, you know, get a new apartment and may have yeah. to buy new furniture or move or whatever. So yeah. I, f- I feel like it's not that far of a thematic stretch to say that when you're at these crossroads, you can figure out what the results are. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Next question we have, um, as you probably listened, we've got Nick. Nick is a question um, junkie. On Twitter, if we say go and ask him some questions, Nick's usually got about five or six. Absolutely. Um, and as you know, his first question is always yes with a question mark. This is uh, Nick. He's um, at Lane Lane at three sixty. Um, his next question is: How are my non wizard friends today? Fantastic, Nick. Thank you for asking. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, he says, "What game should I get next?" Well. Um, I was going to say... Oh, wait, he's tied it in with the next one, which is... He's asked if I'm going to get him a copy of Dead of Winter, which is nice of him. <laughs> um, what game should he get next? Well, um, Wasteland, mean, Ex- Wasteland Express is coming up on Kickstarter. Yeah, uh, no, that will not be on Kickstarter. It'll be pre-order. Oh, pre-order, sorry. Yep, that one uh, is not going to be Kickstarter. Oh, there you go. So we'll talk about that in a minute, actually. Um... His next question is, have you ever read any of the White Wolf fiction? I have not. I've only played uh, one White Wolf RPG. Okay. Um, and I liked it. And I, and I played some D&D in high school. Um, mm. and, I'm, and I'm more into storytelling games now than role-playing games. Yeah. Because I feel, I feel like I really like the role-playing and less of the game portion of it. Which oh, is right, odd. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I like rules light systems like Dungeon World, yeah. where it's more riffing. Um, but no, I've never read any of the fiction. But if he has some suggestions and some really good arts, I love to read. So, well, I will. I will. will I'll respond to Nick because Nick's a good friend of the show, and I'll. I'll. I'll, um, I'll ask him to uh, pass over his recommendations. Well, yeah, then so. I should. I should probably send Nick a copy of The Long Night then. <laughs> That seems like a nice he's still thing. Want, he's still wanting the dead of winter. You if, know that. If, if, he, if he doesn't have a copy of The Long Night, uh, I could probably be convinced to send him one. Oh, there you go. See, there you go, Nick. And I'll sort you out with Dead of Winter, the base game, okay, Nick? <laughs> oh, well, you know, it was his birthday last month, so he's oh. probably due something. He's, he's well, then I feel, like, I feel like I have to. No, you don't have to. Don't, because <laughs> he'll just ask for more things every week then. Oh. And then it, it would be... We'll turn into like it'll be like it'll be like school again. You'll be sending him stuff. Um, <laughs> you'll be sending him foil magic, the gathering cards. Um, <laughs> um, his next question is: I've heard your stance on wizards, but what about druids? They're kind of like wizards. The stance on druids is quite simple: is that druids are failed wizards who decided to who got too close to herbology. <laughs> um, they like their sticks, their stones. They're staring at their moon and they're kind of swimming in the river naked and we we just put them as lazy wizards so we don't, you know, we just leave them alone. They're usually harmless, but they can be slightly annoying and, and they obviously like lentils a lot as well, so you don't want to stick around for them because they pass wind quite a bit. Mo- so mostly like harmless is the classification. Mostly harmless. Um, another question from uh, King Kiwi God. Um, he says... Ask John when he's most in the zone for thinking about new aspects of an amazing game. Um, is it at home, at work, or when you're eating, I guess? <laughs> uh, um, I, you, uh, you, you, you work from home, don't you? So, <laughs> Well, I actually I started renting an office about four or five months ago. Oh, uh, there you go then. Just to kind of get out of the house a little bit. So I can, yeah. I can pretend that I go to work every day. That's kind of cool. Um, where are you go- where are you going, honey? I'm off to the office. Honey. <laughs> yeah, I'm just I'm off to the office. Don't that way the kids just, can't just walk in when I'm yeah. reading comic books or whatever it is that I'm doing the other day. <laughs> I'm trying to play faster than light here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love FPL. That's an excellent yeah, game. Just leave, you know, just leave, just leave us alone. I'm up to this level. Come on, <laughs> my engine's just gone. 
Um, inspira- uh, inspiration kind of hits me everywhere. I I try to write down ideas whenever I think of them as soon as I think of them. Um, so whether it's, you know, I, I've had times where I wake up in the morning and I like dreamed about playing a game during the night. Mm. And I'm like, oh, that would be fantastic if there was a card-based robot fighting game with minis that you like steered your robots <laughs> with your deck. We always joke about a steampunk zombie game. Yeah. So like sometimes I'll just have weird dreams about stuff like that and then write those ideas down or uh, you know sometimes it'll just be through a conversation where somebody says something that's you know apropos of nothing and and you go ah I mean, give yeah. me a second let me yeah. just get my notepad out that let me jot that down let, that was interesting what you said about the mechanic about going and feeding your rabbits <laughs> yeah kind of thing um, he's also asked. This is the same question from uh, King King Kiwi God. He's also asked, how close is the retail version to the first version of Dead of Winter that you created? Uh, it's very different. Okay. And that's that's really the path for any board game. Yes. And it's it's frustrating for new designers um, when they're like, no, this was my concept for the game. This is your first, yeah. This is the first vision, and this is the way I'm. Uh... This is the way I'm going to keep it. Yeah, because a lot of times, I mean, the publisher has their own vision once they see what you're working on. Hmm. Um, you know, the art may not be the style that you envisioned. Um, no. So that's that's always part of the process is yeah. it just changing dra- dramatically, or dr- dramatically, not a made-up Yeah, well, the, ga- the game we spoke about recently on the last, um, well, the last episode me and Colin did was Catacombs. And the the third edition from Catacombs went in a completely different kind of art direction mm-hmm. from the previous versions, and they they turned it from something that looked like a a descent kind of dungeon crawler into the kind of the cartoon um, the cartoon masterpiece that it kind of is today. Now, um, now I haven't listened to the last episode. Um, what's interesting about that third edition of Catacombs is that Quan Chai, uh, the the gentleman who did the art for it. Yeah. Uh, had done the art as a fan expansion for it, where you could really? download it from Board Game Geek and re-sticker it with that style of art. Really? And then they're like that fan base thing. And th- th- what's really cool is like that's a big part of our industry. Like you yeah. can you can make fan content for things because people will see that. Yeah. Well, I've heard about fan content for kind of Dead of Winter. I mean, I've heard about people substituting kind of different things for the zombies like wolves and stuff like that and tried different kind of ways of doing it and i'm you know i guess you know that's you in video games you get mods so i guess Mm -hmm. in board games you're gonna get kind of like your fan your fan input as well i mean just don't make anything uh don't make any fan content for game workshop obviously (laughs) because they they will send somebody to kill you if you do (laughs) And they actually send somebody dressed up like an inquisitor or something like that. You get a blood angel turning up at your office. <laughs> and I'm not, I, I'm not supposed to talk about it much yet. Um, yeah. But I know, I know that it's been officially announced. So I did one of the haunts for the new version of Betrayal. All right. Um, and I will say that it was inspired uh, by some of the the fan things that people did with Dead of Winter. Oh, cool. So I'm really excited about it. Well, that, I mean, I guess that's the other thing. If you see an idea and might spark a little bit, uh, you know, spark something else, which gives you even more of a, you know, an idea for something else. Mm-hmm. Um, Kiwi God also asks, um, how did the did the theme evolve at all when you started off designing Dead of Winter? Did you was it a these are guys that are lost in a colony, no food, no water, potentially ill, and they're fighting against, you know, they're going to have to come up against zombies, or did it evolve from something else? The theme started pretty dead on. Like, I knew I wanted it to be a zombie game that focused on the survivors Mm -hmm. uh, and took place in a really harsh winter. Like, those three elements were there from the very first version. Fantastic. Um, Um, Cool. Yeah. And as I say, it's conti- I mean, it's just a it's it's almost like this is a survival game, and there's some zombies on the side a lot of the time, because mm-hmm. most of the most of the most of the kind of the suspense actually is caused by players you're playing with 
sometimes more than the zombies. Except absolutely. When you, absolutely. Except when you roll the red dice and you get that <laughs> little tooth mark coming up and then you're like, damn it. And you know, we had we had talked about retheming it for quite yeah. a while during the development process. Because mm-hmm. we're like, Oh, people are gonna hate another zombie zombies. game. But yeah. then you know, we talked through it and I and I was like, I think changing it wouldn't be true to the game and no. and it's not just another zombie game in my opinion. No, it's not. It's you know what, it, it sounds weird, but the comparison I've always thought in my head was kinda of Shaun of the Dead. Mm-hmm. Shaun of the Dead was like a romantic comedy that just happened to have zombies around it. Dead of Winter is like a, it's a, an apocalyptic kind of survival game, um, which just happens to have zombies kind of surrounding it as well. Oh yeah, Shaun of the Dead was a huge uh, influence. I'm a, oh, there I'm a big go. fan. There you go. Um, okay, Polyhedron Collider, friends of the show, have said they're just asking a whole barrage of questions. Like, and I'll say this in a nice kind of um, calm voice. Why do you hate me? Why do you feel the need to punish me? Why is every game of Dead of Winter a soul-destroying defeat? <laughs> I can answer that, and I think the simple answer to that is to get better. Yes. I think. <laughs> Stop. Uh, I think you replied to one of the... Oh, yeah. They, they also said, That horse has been used for meat so much we made a range of ready-made lasagna, <laughs> and still the colony starves. <laughs> when we were in playtesting, we aimed for about a 30% win rate. Because I, I feel like thirty to thirty five percent for a co op game is Angels, right where it should be. You fought for that win. You can yep. deserve that win at the end. I like your 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 reply is because you replied on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Are you playing every single outsider card you find? Most people do, and you shouldn't. I didn't know that. I didn't know you could decide not to bother taking an outsider. You could just leave them there. That That is the, as, as far as I've gathered over the last couple of years, that is the most commonly mistaken, one of the most commonly mistaken rules. Um, there you go. Because the rule book says that every card in the deck is an item card. But they mm. say events. So when people say, see event, they think they have to play them. Mm. So it can be a little bit confusing, but yeah. For anybody listening, you don't have to play outsider cards. You can trade them. You can request them. In fact, like in my group, if you have more than one more outsider than any other, or one more survivor than any other player, you're yeah. probably going to get exiled. Oh. Well, so because because more dice yeah. is more you can. And when people complain about the betrayer double turn, like yeah. I think them not understanding that rule plays into that the majority of times. Because you shouldn't have more than two or three survivors. No. If you have if you have five survivors and you have six dice to spend swinging morale, then yeah, you can yeah. make a big swing with two back to back turns. Yeah, yeah. But with with three dice, you're not going to make a huge swing. No, no point. So, and the last thing Polyhedron Collider said, we had a couple of wins under our belt, started to get cocky and push the difficulty up. We were not ready. And that, again, just goes back to stop being <laughs> stop being rubbish. Yeah, just be better. <laughs> stop being... Co- yeah, just be better. You know. hard, hard mode is supposed to be hard mode. If if normal mode is 35%, hard, hard mode's mode. more like 10. Well, there you go. And, oh, here we go. Yeah, Nick, I was looking for this, but Nick did come back and ask when I'm sending him a copy of Dead of Winter. (laughs) He's obviously what, he's, you know, he's just pushing it far too much. But that's, that's entirely up to, up to himself. (laughs) Um, Obviously, we've done Give Us a Kick, which is cool. Um, One of the things that we always do is we do shout outs and we do like a list of podcasts and friends of the show and stuff like that. And, I don't want you to have to sit through kind of um, that, um, and we do it regularly enough that everybody that you know that we everybody that we we speak about knows that we speak about them anyway. Um, but obviously, the shout out is a chance for you to tell us um, about new product, new projects that are coming up. Um, as I say, we've mentioned Heroes and Tricks, um, mm-hmm. which is successful, but Wasteland Express looks very very interesting indeed so um i'd love to hear a little bit more about it i have not i'll tell you i've not i've looked at it it looks very very interesting but for anybody that hasn't had the time to look at this 
give us a rundown about you know what is Wasteland Express and, and why should they be thinking about it? Well, it's a uh, post-apocalyptic uh, pick-up-and-deliver game that was designed by Matt Riddle, Ben Pinchback, and myself. Uh, those cool. two designers have designed some fantastic games. Yes. Um, so I was really excited for the chance to work with them uh, when they when they approached me. Cool. Um, so it's it's a pick up and deliver game. So it has a little bit of Euro game to it and a little bit of a Marathrash to it. And you can really play it in either mode. There's a game mode where you play it like a pure old uh, pure Euro game where yeah. the person with the most money at the end of the game wins. Or you can play it where there's objectives and you're playing for victory points. Um, so, like, we really tried to, um, you know, come up with an organic way to do different game modes. There'll be a little bit of a storyline, so you can play through um, a little bit of a uh, uh, not not scenario, but a, a number of scenarios that make up a campaign. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a story there to explore. Um, we we have a fantastic artist. We got uh, Ricardo Bucarelli. The artist is amazing. I've, uh, I've seen the artwork, as I keep saying on yeah. every podcast, I love a bit of good artwork, and I really, really like the uh, artwork. He does. Uh, he did all the art for a comic book called DMZ, which is a fantastic comic book. People should go and buy that. Yeah. Um, so they can get a little bit of a preview um, on you know the style of work that he does. But you know, seeing him bring this world to life has been absolutely amazing. For some reason, I was reminded a bit of Tank Girl, just mm -hmm. some of the ways the things are and some of the ways the enemies appear and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. this is if you if you took a, a boring Euro game and threw it in a blunder with Tank Girl, Mad Max, and Borderlands, and oh, then wow. poured it into a twelve by twelve box, this is what you get. So, um, how many? I mean, how many players is it going to play? Um, what's the playtime going to be like? Do you reckon? Uh, two to five players, um, cool. and the playtime will depend on what scenario you're playing. Um, yeah. But generally, it should play in less than two hours. That's good. So there'll be, there'll be shorter scenarios and longer scenarios. Yeah, but two hours is a good time because anything longer than that, and then you, um, it can lead to a bit of whether or not you decide to play it again yes um there's some games that i've played that have taken a lot longer than that an entire evening and you get to the end and you kind of feel i've kind of enjoyed it but i know it's going to take that length of time to play again so it might kind of kind of put me off it's it's um, one of the games that um i want to keep playing as a prototype even with the boring artwork like i keep playing it when i'm not doing prototype playtesting there's an in and you've written a, um there's an interesting article that's been written about um the game on on uh, pandasaurus dot com I th is that that's the I think that's yes. the website um and that talks about the <coughs> white pieces of paper um the white pieces of paper being used to it's kind of like the prototype mm -hmm. while you're playing it and that is an interesting read and we'll we'll kind of stick a we'll stick a little link in yeah. the show notes I have. They've done Probably a fantastic either. job. Every Wednesday, or almost every Wednesday, they've done an article, you know, about the game and game development in general. So it's it's been really they've got, cool. They've got like is it Machi Cori and the, mm -hmm. they were responsible for that. They've been responsible for some superb little games. Uh, they they brought Tammany games. Hall out over here uh, yeah. and did the wider release of that, which is a, a fantastic game. Hmm. Machi Koro. Uh I think I have three more games signed with them so we'll be doing a lot of stuff together over the next few years that too. sounds that's really really exciting i mean it's i mean um where can they get i mean if you want i mean we'll put it in the show notes but if you know give us a shout where if you want to get a hold of the um of wasteland express how, how do you do it well you'll want to uh just keep an eye on pandasaurus keep following wasteland wednesdays um, yes. I think they will announce it there. So either follow them on Facebook or Twitter. Um, yes. It's the best way to keep up or follow me because um, I'll certainly let people know. We should have, I believe they're planning on starting pre-orders after Gen Con. Um, Which and, is um, August, isn't it? Uh, yes, August 4th. August 4th. So it's going to be the... It should mid be mid to late August when pre-orders start. And then... Cool. 
um, with the intention of delivery. I don't want to say a date because I'll probably get in trouble. No, but let's not. As soon no. as possible. Yeah. Late this year, early next year. Cool. Um, how much is it going to be? I don't know. I think they're getting the final quotes on everything right now and trying to suss right. that out. So uh, it's going again... to it's going to be pretty chock full of some really nice chunky minis. Um, all uh, the all the re- instead of using resource cubes for things, hmm, yeah. uh, they're all going to be uh, not three D modeled, but uh, plastic injected uh, little like the water is barrels of water, and the guns are little ten millimeter crates of guns. Oh, that sounds awesome! So yeah, it's going to be the production awesome. value is going to be out of this world. Well, we'll I mean we'll keep an eye on it here at um, here at We're Not Wizards. I mean, well, thank you. Simple as because, um, yeah. I'm, I'm, um, sure, I'm sure to get a copy of you guys as soon as possible. <laughs> don't, no, don't, because then we'll be we'll be accused of being corrupt. <laughs> um, which you know, in many ways, we're we're quite happy to be, as we say, we said about catacombs. <laughs> Send us lots of catacombs. You know, let us build a wall and a house. Yes. Um, we do. I did have one message from Colin, um, who said, um, uh, what. What attracts you to dystopian futures? Uh, the, really, the hopelessness. Uh, I've been infatuated with zombies since I was probably thirteen years old and first saw a Night of the Living Dead. Yeah, um, cool. You know the old uh, black and white version, and you know I, I think zombies are a fantastic metaphor for just the the hopelessness of life and the you know constant. Uh, you know, never ending. Like death is always coming at us, and there's no slowing that down. So you have to, mm-hmm. you know, live life to its fullest. So, to me, they've always been the most horrifying monsters. Mm-hmm. Um, and I and I like, uh, yeah, I like general dystopian and post-apocalyptic things, just because I think it's always interesting to see. Uh, like one of my favorite books is The Road by Cormac McCarthy. Yeah. Um, and seeing you know those little glimmers of hope. And like how people get tested by these uh, dystopian universes, and you know what makes us human. Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, uh, um, so Colin did actually manage to get on the show. Yes, <laughs> which is good. Uh, he must be on his way back from. Uh, he must be on his way back getting the antibiotics if he's able to text in this kind of wasteland. I've got to ask him where he actually gets the electricity to charge his phone from, but. <laughs> That'll be another thing. Um, if people want to find you, um, where where can they find you? Um, you know, um, if they want to, if they do want to find you on Twitter, or Facebook, you know, where, where's the best place if they want to connect? Uh, probably the best place is Twitter at John J O N Gilmore G I L M O U R. They can follow me there. Um, interact with me. I love meeting people at conventions, so if you ever at a convention that I'm at, um, you know, I'm more than happy to make time to sit down and play a game and talk and spend some yeah. time together. You've been, I mean, um, we've been, spe- as I say, we, we kind of figured out we've been speaking for um, a little over a year and a half now, um, kind of back and forward, and um, I've always, you know, you're just, it's like, it's always easy just to drop me a quick email say hello and have a little conversation and then you kind of we both get on with stuff after that but it's uh, um this has been this has been a lot of fun um, yeah it's been great I've, thank I've, you for having I've, me I've, you know, I've really enjoyed kind of having you on um again again keep an eye out for wasteland express because it looks something that's like really really exciting um when heroes and tricks um when that when we can get our hands on that, we'll, I mean, normally anything that comes through, we will we will we'll play it and we'll put it on the got to the table section. Um, for ourselves, you can get us on Twitter at We Are Not Wizards. You can get us on Facebook, facebook dot com forward slash We Are Not Wizards. You can email us magic at We Are Not Wizards dot com <laughs> or dot co dot uk. Um, again, John, many thanks for. Um, for kind of spending your afternoon talking to this uh, this blatant fanboy. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> yeah, but um, 
just going on just again thanks again for for being on and 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 just for everybody out there remember that we are many things but we're not wizards say goodbye john goodbye (laughs) bye for now thank you